underlying fault of this study is that it assumes every dollar spent on an import is not a dollar spent on a US made good. That's the underlying assumption. But we all know that, so that's gross trade balances, but we all know that to be false because if most of the things that we import contain content from the US and from many countries, then clearly we need to look at the value added trade balances. And guess what? A dollar spent on an import from China it is actually 70 cents spent on American value and supporting American jobs. And a dollar spent on Mexican imports actually is at least 40 cents of value going to American companies. And so these job loss numbers are based on a very misleading way of measuring trade. Yes, uh, so I am so pleased. I saw Jeremy Haft um, at our national conference in November, and I just walked right up to him and said, please come and speak to us in Boston, because I was very impressed by his, um, his variety of, of knowledge and perspective on China. Um, and I'm right, because it says so right here, for almost two <laughs> decades, uh, Jeremy has been building companies on the front lines in China. He has overseen hundreds of sourcing and import-export programs between American and Chinese enterprises in a wide variety of industries and agriculture, spanning, uh, sorry, agriculture, spanning shipbuilding and refineries to auto parts and medical supplies to maple syrup and cow hides. As I said, unique variety of perspectives. <laughs> His current startup is a public-private partnership with Cornell University Cooperative Extension funded by a grant from New York State to build export markets in China for New York agriculture. He's an adjunct professor at Georgetown's School of Foreign Service and McDonough School of Business, and the author of All the Tea in China, a primer on how to do business in China, and the recent Unmade in China, which we have for sale and back and for signing, uh, which examines America's enduring competitive advantages over China in the coming century, which is not something that we hear about a lot these days. He's conducted many briefings about China trade and US competitiveness to members of Congress, ambassadors, senior military officers, and the business community. His analysis has, has also been featured in the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Financial Times, CNN, NPR, CNBC, and Fox, among others. So we're excited to uh, have Jeremy speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary, thank you. Tom, thank you. And thank you all <laughs> for braving the weather. Un unlike our commander in chief, I don't ascribe God's moods to the weather and, and uh, the creator's um, attitude towards me in a given day, but today's travel was not easy. It felt like uh, we said Dr. Zhivago sort of moving on a long train through the snowy countryside. But I'm here, and I'm glad that you're here, because we have a lot to talk about. Um, so the big questions, right, are uh, in regards to trade. Will we enter into a trade war with China? Um, how negative will this be for the United States? Will it kill jobs? If so, how many? Will it be good for the United States? Is it time that we start showing China what for. Um, certainly, it, it feels right to raise prices on stuff that we import from, from countries like China and Mexico. And if we looked at the primaries this season, we saw that over 25 million primary voters moved away from the establishment candidates and voted for Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Um, Votes normally, we would have thought, would have gone to Jeb, exclamation point, and the other candidate, Hillary. But they went to these upstart candidates whose messages on trade were very similar. In fact, um, Trump started to sort of quote Bernie. And the, the two of them um, both ascribed um, the long decline of the American middle class to trade. Um, and to losses from trade to China and to Mexico. So no matter what side of the aisle you're on, whether you voted for Donald Trump or didn't vote for Trump, this was a message that resonated a lot this election season. Now, of course, 
people who have their antenna open have heard these themes for a while. I mean, you know, the last election between Mitt Romney and Obama, who remembers Mitt Romney's uh, campaign slogan? Anyone? Extra, extra credit. <laughs> um, an extra Danish. Hmm? Right. This is true. <laughs> so it, his slogan was, believe in America. Kind of, it kind of sounds a little like make America great again. And if we look at the Pew attitude surveys, these big polls that they do worldwide about um, when people were asked, what is the world's number one economic superpower? You know, leading up to the, the Romney-Obama election and now coming into to, to Trump um, versus Clinton. The majority of respondents around the world said China is, is the number one economic superpower. So that means most Americans believe that China is number one. So no wonder people look at this and say, make America great again, believe in America. It makes sense to tax stuff that we, we bring in from China. If they're stealing our jobs, and this is a flat world, and the flat world is sort of tilting east and all of our jobs are going away, then how, what does the next century mean for America? So the way to tackle these questions is through the numbers. Because when we assert that China is number one, what do we base that on? Uh, well, when you, we read the newspaper these days, we often see China, you know, comma, the world's second largest economy. Sometimes we see China, comma, the world's largest economy. So that is based on an economic metric that some of us learn in school. It's called GDP, gross domestic product. And this is a number that was developed during the Great Depression. Because FDR and his team were trying to wrap their arms around getting the country going again and trying to measure how much our country could make at a given time. So these days, when we measure GDP, when the World Bank measured, GD, measured GDP or the IMF, what they're adding up is spending across the economy. So they're adding up how much consumers spent, how much businesses spent, how much gover government spent, right? And they're comparing how much America spent to how much China spent to how much other countries spent. So the, kind of the crazy thing about that is if we were trying to compare our wealth, our household wealth, for example, would we compare how much we spent in a given year? So I, I had kids, you know, went to summer camp and we got braces and it was a difficult, you know, so we spent a quarter of a million dollars this year, easy. But, you know, but you spent a half a million dollars last year. You know, so therefore, you're, you're richer than I am. You have the richer household. No, you know, the, so the, the rule in, in, in business school is we look at the balance sheet, right? We're going to look at assets and liabilities, net worth. So when we look at the balance sheet of America, and we compare it to the balance sheet of China, so that means all of our assets, households, businesses, and government, plus liabilities, right? We hear a lot about American debt, the $20 trillion debt. We factor that in. China's got a lot of debt too, by the way, $25 trillion plus. We, add, we factor that in. And when we compare the balance sheet of the U.S. versus the balance sheet of China, the U.S. is $45 trillion richer. $45 trillion richer. If we're only looking at households, just households alone, American household value is $80 trillion. China's is around $22 trillion. So you say, well, China's catching up quickly. Actually, no, the gap in wealth is growing. In fact, the United States is getting richer, and China, if anything, is stagnating. And all signs point to a stagnating economy. Now, looking at the perspective of, oh, China's about to run over us in the global economy, that's propelled by numbers like GDP that make us think China's a lot bigger than it is. Other numbers that make China appear like they're bigger than they are are trade numbers. So we've heard a lot this campaign season about trade numbers and trade balances. So this is another old number, right? We talk about GDP was formed in the 1930s. We measure trade balances like we were still trading wine for cloth. Okay, this is a very old paradigm. Now, most folks don't, you know, we don't take home ec anymore like we used to in, in school or shop. But, you know, if we took modern shop, right, 
and we learned where does stuff come from? You know, where does this come from? Where do these shoes come from? How about this microphone? How about that? You know, how about the air conditioner grills? Where are things made today? We would see that very, very, very few things that we consume on a day-to-day -day basis are made by one country alone. They're usually made by many countries in collaboration. So, you know, this tie may actually have been fabricated in Southeast Asia, but chances are the cotton may have come from a, a farm in Texas. You know, the United States is one of the world's leading exporters of cotton. Um, you know, these, these shoes may have been made in China, for example, right? Or my wallet. But, you know, the hides, the cattle hides, might have come from an American farm, an American ranch. Hides, cattle hides exports, is one of our top ag exports to China. My, my cell phone has many parts in it that were made in the United States. It also has many parts that were made in Germany, South Korea, Japan. But the funny thing is that we measure all of these imported goods as if the last country that shipped it to us made them. So we, we take an iPhone. Now, if you, if you break it down in terms of the value added to one of these things, less than 10% goes to China for some components and assembly, OK? But we count 100% of this as a Chinese traded import in our trade statistics. The cattle hides in my shoes may have come from Iowa. But if they were made in China, we count them 100% Chinese made. Our trade numbers are, are called gross trade numbers. And what we need to be doing is looking at value added trade. How much value in a given product was contributed to a certain country? If we looked at the value add, a whole different picture emerges. Suddenly we see, oh my goodness, America has a big role in the global supply chain that we don't often see because of these numbers. So why does this matter? Because when we make trade policies that feel good, so when President Obama was, was in office, we were importing solar panels from, from China. And the solar panels were being dumped at very, very, very cheap prices into our economy. Um, so a trade, a case, was brought by Solar World, a German solar panel maker in the United States, um, looking for protection from Chinese dumping. And the Commerce Department um, agreed to levy tariffs as high as 249% on solar panels. So if we were just looking at gross trade balances, it looks like China is creaming us in solar panels. Because what we're not measuring is what goes into a solar panel. So before a solar panel becomes a solar panel, it starts out as PV polysilicon, which is a raw material that changes light into energy. Well, guess what? That's something the United States makes a lot of, <laughs> believe it or not. Oh, didn't know that. Um, and these solar panels are made on big, expensive machines, capital equipment. Oh, the United States makes a lot of that. Oh. Oh, yeah, we also export that stuff. So if we measure our total trade with China in solar, not just panels, but solar, the whole industry, the US is a net exporter to China. We sell them more value in solar than we buy because we're selling them raw materials that go into all those panels, and we're selling them the capital equipment that go and make those panels. So suddenly, lo and behold, when tariffs come up 249% on the panels, it slows down the demand for these panels, right? They become more expensive. Therefore, you need less raw materials from America and less capital equipment from America. And so Obama's tariffs on solar panels did they save jobs in the solar industry? They were actually a job loss. They were a net job loss. Because the suppliers of the raw materials had to fire workers. And the capital equipment guys had to fire workers. And the problem is, is that the way that we measure trade obscures all of this activity. When we look at gross trade numbers, it appears as if China is 
selling us everything and we're selling China very little. But when we measure what goes into the products, we see that, oh, out of every dollar worth of Chinese imports that we bring in, over 70 cents goes to US firms. So that, that money goes for the raw material inputs and also all the jobs associated with taking the, 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 the products in from China, transporting them, warehousing them, retailing them, that supports jobs in retail and finance and construction, et cetera, et cetera. So of every dollar of Chinese imports we bring in, 70 cents goes to American firms. Of every dollar we bring in from Mexican imports, at least 40 cents goes to US firms, probably more. So when we, when we heard throughout the campaign, Bernie Sanders and Trump say, and then other surrogates like Jeff Sessions on the stump, talked a lot about trade balances. You know, now they're talking about Russia, but then it was trade balances, right? And they all were preaching from the same hymnal. And they said, guess what? Our trade imbalances with China, with Mexico, have cost us hundreds of thousands of jobs. A quote from Jeff Sessions, these are job-killing numbers. So again, we go back to the numbers and we look, how do they arrive at these conclusions? Well, number one, if you read the fine print, and if you look at who is making the claim that trade imbalances kill jobs, it's almost always from a single think tank. One think tank specializes in this in Washington, called the Economic Policy Institute. And I'm going to show you some, some quotes from Bernie and from Donald during the campaign trail, according to the EPI. If the TPP is agreed to, the US will lose more than 130,000 jobs to Vietnam. Donald Trump and Economic Policy Institute analysis found that Ohio has already lost more than 100,000 jobs. So trade deals were cast as bad for the economy based on trade balance data, which are linked to job losses. And indeed, on the day after uh, the first debate, between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. This was on um, Jake Tapper's show, The Lead, on CNN. And they were doing kind of a fact check of Clinton's claims about trade. And they say, on one side, Clinton defends NAFTA on debate stage. Shock. And then we see the reality, OK? Reality, that means fact. This is not fake. This is reality. <laughs> trade deal cost US 800,000 jobs to Mexico between 1997 and 2013. Who's the source? Economic Policy Institute. Why is that important? Because the, the, the EPI uses numbers that were created, a model created by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, right? And the head of the BLS came out and said, you know what, my model was never intended <laughs> to predict job losses through trade. Um, the, the underlying fault of this study is that it assumes every dollar spent on an import is not a dollar spent on a US made good. That's the underlying assumption. But we all know that, so that's gross trade balances, but we all know that to be false because if most of the things that we import contain content from the US and from many countries, then clearly we need to look at the value-added trade balances. And guess what? A dollar spent on an import from China is actually 70 cents spent on American value and supporting American jobs. And a dollar spent on Mexican imports actually is at least 40 cents of value going to American companies. And so these job loss numbers are based on a very misleading way of measuring trade. When we actually look at value-added trade, we start to see where all the jobs are in the United States that we don't talk about. So when you raise tariffs on solar panels, you wind up killing all these jobs you didn't know you had. It's similar with what we're hearing about in terms of the border adjustment tax, right, which has sort of become popular in the Republican conference. Um, the administration, it seems, wants to try to pay for a lot of expensive things, <laughs> right, like infrastructure and perhaps building you know, a literal or metaphorical wall, we can't decide. Um, 
How are you going to pay for that? So the idea is, let's tax at the border all the imports that are coming in. So let's think about this with the same logic that we think about with the solar panels. If we tax all of what we buy from China or Mexico by 40-something percent, then let's look at what happens to the jobs in the Rust Belt, OK? Because the Rust Belt was, was a big supporter of the current administration, helped Donald Trump win. So what would happen to jobs in the Rust Belt if this border adjustment tax got passed? Well, yes, we saw images of shuttered factories in the campaign, right? And we heard a lot about tombstones littering the landscape and American carnage. But if you look at the top 10 exporting states in America to China, the top 10, the Rust Belt states are all in there. Why? Because the Rust Belt is a, a, a big manufacturer <laughs> in ways we don't often know, advanced manufacturing. For example, they make a lot of the auto parts that go into cars that we consume. So when we import a car from Mexico or Canada, NAFTA, that trade deal, requires that at least 60% of the auto parts come from the United States. So that means every car that comes in from Mexico or Canada that's an American-made car, they're buying parts from Michigan, from Ohio, Pennsylvania, supporting jobs. So let's think about it. If we raise the tariffs on these imports and make it more expensive for us to buy the cars from Mexico and Canada, the imported cars slow down. We buy less auto parts from the Rust Belt, and therefore we shed jobs in the Rust Belt. So ultimately, tariffs are not what protects jobs. The problem with tariffs is that they may save some jobs at the expense of other jobs. Because if we look at where America adds value in individual products, we do it in many places in the global supply chain. So for example, when we raise tariffs on steel, we may protect one job in the steel industry, but we kill three more jobs downstream in companies that use steel. So tariffs wind up saving some jobs at the expense of other jobs. If we want to help all American workers, right, there are other ways to fix trade. So my opinion is, yes, we, we can fix trade, but not through protectionism. The way we fix trade is by focusing on what the economists call externalities. So that means all the negative stuff that our transactions cause the world that companies don't usually pay for and consumers don't usually pay for. So we, in effect, when we are buying imported goods very cheaply, we are subsidizing these externalities. What externalities? Um, carbon. You know, for example, when we eat, you trust the Gordon's fishermen, you know, we, we have fish sticks in the box and it says, oh, caught off the deep blue seas of, in Alaska. But that fish might have been caught in Alaska, but it was sent thousands of miles away to China to be deboned and filleted and breaded and boxed and sent back. In fact, over 80% of the fish and seafood that we consume in this country that's been processed has gone through China. You won't see that on the label. Think about all the externalities, okay? All the bunker fuel that these ships are burning across the oceans just to save a few pennies on, on the cost structure. We as consumers are subsidizing that. So if we started to factor in the cost of carbon miles in imported goods, that would impact the cost structure of trade, and it wouldn't pick winners and losers. Another externality is health and safety. Because increasingly, we're importing stuff from China we don't even know about. So for example, you know, I talk about the things we're wearing, the things around us. The medicines we take also have imported inputs. In fact, 80% of the active ingredients in our medicines come from China or India. And India sources most of its inputs from China. <laughs> OK? This is the country that has one of the most gruesome and worst health safety records in the world. Um, you know, we thought we solved this issue with the FDA um, and with Upton Sinclair and the jungle. Uh, you know, the jungle is now our supplier. And so by focusing on health and safety, 
We can also adjust trade. Look at what Japan does. Japan trades a lot of food with China. They learned a long time ago that it was unsafe. So they made it much harder for China to sell to Japan. You know, for us, I mean, we let, come on in. You, sure, you can sell us things. The really scary thing is that most of the active ingredients in China are made in chemical factories. Chemicals are not regulated by the Chinese FDA. It's, a, it's, a, it's this crazy loophole in their law. So do you remember heparin, the blood thinner? Okay, this was a blood thinner distributed by Baxter. Baxter Pharmaceuticals through American hospitals killed over 250 Americans coming from bad batches in China that went through a supplier that was never inspected by the FDA, never inspected by the Chinese FDA, and never inspected by Baxter. <laughs> okay, so let's tighten up our regs on, on health and safety. Make it harder for the Chinese to sell to us. Um, that would also raise the prices of the goods that we import without picking winners and losers. So while we open it up for questions, I invite you to think about um, however good certain policies may feel, how would they really impact jobs in the United States? Um, and to look beyond the numbers that we typically hear um, towards a reality that's much more optimistic about America. I mean, we certainly have our share of, of challenges, of wage inequality, for example, um, of, of a slowly growing economy, but we are also a highly competitive, resilient country. If you look at our exports to China, they're not just from Washington State and Texas and California. They're shared across every state. Um, 401 districts, that's like 92% of all congressional districts, have at least doubled their exports to China in the past 10 years. So that's every state, every county, every city. And our services exports are growing even faster. Massachusetts is number six for service exports to China. Um, one service export that we count is education. So China must have learned that there's some pretty good schools in this area. Over a billion dollars worth of service exports in education in one year alone. So again, beyond the numbers that we hear is a much brighter picture of the United States. Um, one in which we are competitive, we are resilient, we are exporting, and we're supporting jobs in many parts of our economy. And that when you try to protect one node, you wind up killing jobs in other nodes. So I'll leave it there. Let's open it up for questions, and we can dive into any and all areas. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that cotton is a major export of the United States. A book was published a year ago called Empire of Cotton. I don't know if you read it, but it's a marvelous history of the cotton industry starting the beginning of the 19th century. And it was totally dependent upon American cotton from the South. It was the biggest product from the United States. That died, of course, when you couldn't produce cotton cheaply. But what you are saying now is that cotton and I know other agricultural products are a huge part of our export industry. And cotton is one of those, I guess. And it's produced totally differently today. But uh, I wasn't aware of that statistic. That's, that's reassuring. There's another great book, Empire of Cotton is Great, and there's another one called Travels of a T-Shirt in the Global Economy, which actually follows how a T-Shirt is made from the Texas cotton farm. What, I'll take one second to, what drives China's agriculture demand is something that is kind of shocking. You could fit China's arable land on the state of Texas, right? So we think about big, big country, 20% of the world's population, they have very little arable land. And the arable land that they have is shrinking to the tune of 1,200 square kilometers a year from the Gobi Desert expanding. And plus, they have a major water catastrophe right now. Most of the cities don't have access to the water they need. Um, most of the water for agriculture is not fit for use. So we, we're seeing a full-on catastrophe now in terms of food security and food safety, which is what drives China to buy ag from us. Why China bought Smithfield, right, the world's largest pork producer out of North Carolina, supporting 140,000 jobs, and why China keeps buying stuff like cotton, like soybeans, like hides, um, because they, lack, they structurally lack the land to do it. And that's not something that's going to go away, right? In the next century, it's going to get worse. 
Hi, um, I just spent a month in uh, Shenzhen. Yeah. And that's a city that has, like, has come out of thin air in the past 50 years, basically, as a mega city. And my observation living there um, as a young politics student was that um, there isn't really a sense of culture or unity or anything. And I didn't spend very much time in other cities, at least not on this trip. But I was wondering what you think about the massive growth that China's going through and perhaps this beginning of a feeling of disenfranchisement uh, in terms of a culture, um, or it felt almost like a ghost town when I was in the several downtowns of Shenzhen. Um, interesting question, and one that I, I can speculate about. I mean, the so having worked very closely with people from throughout China for 20 years, um, one thing that you're kind of struck by as an American in terms of our sense of history versus Chinese sense of history is that you know, my partner's, so my partner's in her 50s. Her dad lived through the Long March and the Cultural Revolution um, and their family suffered privations the likes of which we in America, thank God, have never had to know. Um, this is in recent familial memory. So this is like my grandpa, my grandma. Um, so before that, we have the century of humiliation, where China traded with the West and was exploited. And Chinese school kids learn this as if it were last Tuesday. <laughs> so the, you know, they're bringing a perspective to what's happening now, their experimentation with modernity, that is driven by need, need to put food on the table, need to survive, and seeing the perspective of that, right? So if you look at China's farms, there are 140 million small family farms that are sort of one click beyond starvation. And you start to see why all the food safety scandals emerge, but you also start to see the human element as well. It's not so much that China's trying to poison us to death, as some people think. Um, so uh, the answer is, uh, you know, looking at China's history, what they're going through now is kind of <laughs> nothing compared to, I mean, th this is, there, many, many people are better off than they have been. More than a billion people have sort of been lifted from poverty. Um, but still, I mean, it's still a very, very tough life. And I mean, you visited there. It's, it's not so easy to live. Um, you're also seeing lots of incidents of unrest, tens of thousands of incidents of unrest each year and acts of violence, you know, where we have gun violence, random acts of gun violence in our, in our country. China has stabbings and machetes and all kinds of things which sort of show um, a, a sadness in the soul as well. I mean, you're getting a sort of a cultural feeling. Other scholars have argued about whether there's a decline of Confucianism, but that's not a topic for today. Um, Hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you for this presentation. My name is Matt. I'm originally from Eastern Europe. Now, you mentioned this depleting arable land, and what we see in Eastern Europe is Chinese leasing yes. arable land on a full scale. On a massive scale. For instance, in the Ukraine, Ukraine. they leased more than 3,000, I think 3 million square kilometers, million. which is bigger than the size of the state of Massachusetts. Yes. Bulgaria, Serbia, not as good. Yeah, Bulgaria, Serbia, and so on. So right. do you think like this will help fix their problem? And I don't see this being a, a hot topic or an issue in the US. Right, no, it's not. Uh, it, it sort of bubbled up around the Smithfield acquisition because some states forbid foreign ownership of farms. And so when the Smithfield farms crossed many states, and so that had to be negotiated. But um, Uh, could you say the first part of your question again? I'm sorry. My question is, is this on the radar? Yeah. I mean, so I, I, it's not uh, aside from that. And so, for example, the very fact that a three million square mile parcel of Ukraine was leased by China is not something that we tend to hear on the Rachel Maddow show. Or, <laughs> although, it, right? I mean, it would probably do well, but, but they don't talk about that. So. Will, will it solve China's problems? I don't think so. I mean, they have 20% of the world's population. 
now they're loosening the one-child policy again, right? So now they're trying to turn on the spigot of demography. Um, one of the reasons is because they're getting, to, you know, elderly workers are outnumbering younger workers, just like we saw in Japan. So, you know, they're trying to enact those policies, but um, they're damned if they do, damned if they don't, right? Because the more people that, that are born, the tougher it is to feed them. So look, it's not just Ukraine, right? They're buying in Africa as well, South America. Ultimately, this will come down to water, I believe, as well. Um, you know, as China runs out of, of drinkable water. Um, but no, I, I, don't, I don't think it will solve it. And I actually think that in many ways, scarcity, Chinese scarcity will define demand in the next century. So trade will not follow what, what, de what trade deals are struck, but, what, but, but scarcity, and mostly Chinese scarcity. Hello, you mentioned uh, China as an example, and Chinese trade, between, well, trade between Japan and China. Um, is there, I know Honda, for example, they, also Kia and Hyundai, they have plants in America where parts are made in, in Korea and Japan, but perhaps from American materials. So right. it's like they send their manufacturing to the U.S. Is there sort of an, like a way you would think they could almost solve that or help that in terms of bringing American, bringing manufacturing in America, even if it's via some sort of Chinese company or some way to bring the manufacturing in America with the American products other than tariffs or however? Yeah, uh, so, um, I, I, look, I definitely think that some, some so look, we're seeing trade policies now that seem to be advocating the repatriation of, of supply chains, right? So we've heard this from Peter Navarro and others in, in, in Trump's trade shop that he wants to sort of roll back the global supply chains and bring them into our country. Now, in some areas, I actually think, think this is a good idea, okay? So for example, insulin. We rely now primarily on China to make our insulin. In fact, if China did not make our insulin, we would have a, a severe problem. So that, to me, is national security. And that, and that, I believe, we should have our own capacity and capability. Insulin would be good. <laughs> Other meds would be good, too. Um, other industries, I, I feel, benefit from openness. So, for example, you mentioned autos. Yeah. So the U.S. auto industry has changed a lot since the, you know, the buggy whip, okay? So jobs have, have changed. So nowadays, you're right, some parts come in from other countries, and the reason they do is often because they, they're cheaper. Mm. Now, if we focused on externalities, like making companies pay for the carbon miles to ship them halfway around the world, that might change it a little bit. If we're making them pay for health and safety, that might impact. So um, in some areas, like food and drugs, that might significant, significantly affect the cost of that more production might come back, or into safer countries where the supply chains are not as risky. Mm. But in auto, the way America works is that, look at the, look at the Rust Belt. Um, if, we, if we look at manufacturing output today versus 1980, we produce two times as much as we did in 1980 with half the jobs. So what's happened in America is a revolution in innovation, right, streamlining, um, and automation. Trade dislocation happened, but not nearly the way that it was politicized to be. I should just say very briefly, when we look at job numbers every month, so when the number came out last month that said, we created 283,000 jobs, and everybody, yay, and it's, it's Trump's, Trump's fault, it's not Trump's fault, and everybody's arguing, but this, these are net jobs. These are not gross jobs. America churns through four to six million jobs a month, right? That means we lose four to six million jobs a month, and we create them. And then on top of that churn are the net jobs of 200,000 or what have you, right? So as an open economy, when the Rust Belt sheds jobs in mills, steel mills, for example, it then creates jobs making advanced auto parts and aerospace parts and optics 
and advanced plastics and all this stuff that's sold to the world and sold to America. So jobs are lost, jobs are created. I think the best way to create American and support American jobs is not through the tariffs, but through investing in the education of the next generation of American workers. So rather than paying attention to tariffs, which actually don't really help, let's figure out how do we employ Americans in manufacturing where they say up to 50% of all of our jobs could be lost because of automation. Now that, this is like McKinsey. This is not just me or Breitbart. I mean, you know, um, that's scary. So we need to be preparing for that. Um, education and also investing in the social safety net for, for when workers are dislocated. I mean, if you look at all the advanced economies, we spend less per capita than all the advanced economies in terms of worker retraining, worker relocation. We've got like 14 programs, but they just don't work well together. So we could be doing a lot more, but bringing jobs back is, is um, tougher than just raising tariffs on a single product. Yeah, <laughs> and do you mind if I add a caveat, oh, yeah. a caveat question? And I'll, um, yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, a lot of um, manufacturing, I guess, uh, like with CPUs, for example, they're designed by American companies or s companies in certain countries, but then manufactured uh, right. globally. How, do, how would that sort of relate to sort of an openness, a closeness, especially with China having a history of going against sort of certain patent laws, skirting them and doing? So this is a breakdown of a typical iPhone. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the main components, you see Japan with flash memory and display module and touchscreen, and then the costs, right? We see Korea, we see Germany, we see the United States. Where's China? China's here in the manufacturing costs and assembly, right? and some non-critical components. Now, the openness of the supply chain allows Apple to capture 30% profit on top of the goods, which support jobs. Apple's supply chain support jobs. So if these jobs, if this was all made in the US, you're looking at a much more expensive product. Um, Again, you know, people say, well, if it's at the cost of American jobs, who cares if it's an expensive product? But you know, what, what drove globalization was not these trade deals, right? It was innovations in the containerization of the ports, internet, you know, transportation, intermodal, um, drove globalization. So this is the product of globalization. Uh, now, in terms of the IP question, I mean, you're right, you know, ch China, engages in widespread IP theft. Not just spying, but IP, th IP theft. So my point of view on this, and we could spend a, uh, like a seminar at Georgetown, but is that if you look at what China makes, right, what they make is risky, okay? Having made things in China for decades, if you look at China's track record, They've had tens of thousands of safety scandals just in the past few years, touching every aspect of their economy. And the reason is not because of this guy's corrupt or that guy's corrupt. It's a systemically risky structure where every node is adding risk that the outputs will be unsafe. That we can dive in deeper at another time or buy the book, which goes in deeper. But suffice it to say that if you download a terabyte of data from the military, doesn't mean you can make it. It doesn't mean that you can send it through this risky system and have it made reliably again and again and again. So I don't tend to um, get n overly nervous when IP secrets are stolen because I, if you look at, for example, high-speed rail, you know, where designs from Kawasaki and Hyundai were, 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 were propagated, um, China's inability to implement this system and run it efficiently and safely is, what's, is what bears itself out. So we see fatal crashes that are not just from a single pilot error or you know, a, a, a single crack in a wheelbase. There are systemic failures along the system. So bottom line, 
the IP theft is a big deal, but I don't see China being able to take it and, and leapfrog over America um, in terms of technology implementation. You first have to rationalize your supply chain and fix rule of law, right? You can't make safe things without rule of law. Sort of like importing the, I think they were German nuclear engineers to build all their nuclear plants that they're... Right, but the nuclear plants are being built on Westinghouse designs, yeah. GE designs with American-made parts, some of which are made in Massachusetts, actually. Thank you. This is a rather simplistic question. The new Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, yes. I know that he made a lot of his money in Mexico. I don't know if he did anything in China. Does he understand what you have told us here tonight? <laughs> Wilbur Ross. And if so, is he telling the White House, or does the White House not want to hear? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Wilbur Ross, um, I, what I do know about Wilbur Ross is that he has made his fortunes through international finance, and it also um, sending production to other countries. So I know that he understands the low-cost benefits of trade, but in terms of the the numbers, the trade balances, I'm not so sure. I mean, I've spoken to economists at the, at the Commerce Department who don't know from this. Um, now, the World Trade Organization in Japan know, you know, so they're investing in updating their trade numbers, um, trying to make value-added trade instead of gross trade. But interestingly, I mean, with this administration, I don't know if you saw this headline, um, but I, here, I, I, I was very excited. It, it, you know, this is recently in the journal. It said, Trump administration considers change in calculating US trade deficit. I thought, oh, goody. You know, we're finally going to start to count the value in our imports. Not, not, not so. What, what they're trying to do is make the distortion look even more. So what they're trying to do is take away counting re-exports in our exports. That means when a product comes into our country, let's say from Canada, and then is exported out without transformation, um, they want to take that out of our export numbers. It's just a small bit of it, but when you look at what we export from America, when we make, when we make something, it usually is about 85 to 90% US made. That's not, not so much China, right? When we bring things in from other countries, China usually assembles them from parts that are made in many places. So when we export out, about 85 to 90% is domestic content. The imports are what's distorted. This is what we need to be investing in measuring better. The WTO is and Japan is, but the Commerce Department is not. And whether Wilbur Ross cares about this, I mean, data is probably not on the list of things that they're going to be funding anytime soon. Um, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I've seen some manufacturing uh, in China. And uh, uh, some of the uh, factories, manufacturing jobs that they do there, I don't think they are a good fit here to the labor here. So when people say, you know, China took our job, right. it, it doesn't really res resonate with me. In my opinion, they're doing the job that cannot be done here, uh, environmentally or even uh, human labor. Right. Right. So... Where do, you, how do you think this, this can be understood here? Um, thank you. Th thank you for that question. No, I, I think that in large part, um, we have benefited from using China as our platform because of externalities, right? Our companies are able to pollute and into the air, into the rivers, into the land without pesky regs, um, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we make this known, as you say? I mean, part of this is becoming aware, I believe, of what it takes to make the products that we consume every day. Um, <laughs> no, I know. I, no, see, this is, this is where trade deals, I think, are important. So TPP um, got a lot of bad press, but one thing TPP was trying to do was bring NAFTA into the 21st century by negotiating at least basic environmental protocols. 
and basic, basic regulations prohibiting illegal logging and that kind of thing as a start. Um, trade deals are one way where we can, where we can do that. The, you know, the Paris Accords are another way we can do that. But you know, ultimately, um, it's about consumers, right? So if we know what, what went into making this in terms of hum, human cost, environmental cost, health and safety cost, then it impacts our purchasing decision at the end of the day. Um, and I think that, I mean, so ultimately it's, uh, it's up to us to make better and more informed decisions. Uh, thank you for sharing all the information. Actually, I'm from mainland China, so I, I think it's pretty interesting to, uh, to know something that's shared by the American professor. So uh, actually, uh, uh, because I know uh, from the withdrawal of the UK from the European Union and from the point of view from Trump that about the uh, China stealing jobs, mm. uh, China stealing jobs from U.S. Something. It just seems that more and more people begin to doubt about the globalization. Mm. So my question is: uh, Is that do you think that the globalization for many many years that make the the whole world is more vulnerable, and it seems that more countries begin to feel bad about that and reluctant to it? Thank you. I think that's a I think that's a great question. Um, interestingly, if you look at our decline in manufacturing jobs over the past 20 years, China's been losing more jobs than we have. Um, so this is part of a global trend. Ha has, I think in many ways globalization has made us stronger in ways that are invisible. <laughs> so difficult to prove, difficult to sell, intangible. I mean, the original theory after World War II when we formed these multinational bodies, the World Bank, the IMF, um, the goal was if we're trading with each other, we're not sending armies into each other's countries. And the great experiment after World War II, until now, has been the um, expansion of this open system, open borders, open flows of capital, open immigration. Now, I, I believe this has largely made us better because it's allowed our countries to focus on what we do best, right? So the United States, our sweet spot is high-end manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, agriculture, and services. And that's what trade allows us to focus on. It's also allowed other countries like China to bring a billion people out of poverty. So it has done a lot of good. It's also done a lot of bad, right? It's also dislocated a lot of families, right? So what our government has not done a great job doing, and I think EU has fallen down on, is in policies that help those have been dis who have been dislocated from trade. And, and helping to make Americans and the world understand why trade is actually <laughs> helpful. It's more than just keeping prices down. It's more than just cheap prices at Walmart. Because the stuff that we buy that, from all over the world supports all these jobs in our country. So I think it, where it's made us weaker is the way that our numbers have reported it, right? So we have old numbers. Our numbers have not kept a pace with globalization, and by using misleading trade balances has led to politicizing jobs and politicizing globalization, um, using numbers from the EPA, you know, from one think tank to prove your job. You know, so this has not been a debate that has been a full-throated, full thought through debate in our country for many, many years. I would, I would argue since Ross Perot and the giant sucking sound. It's been down, downhill from there. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we've, we have a lot of explaining to do. I mean, and, and, and now we see sort of anti-globalization is picking up momentum in, in many capitals. So is this the fault of globalization? I think it's, it's more the fault of our inability to help those who have been dislocated and our inability to explain why open borders are good, why open borders ultimately help humanity rise. Um, if we do it smart, and if we pay for the negative externalities, we don't subsidize the spoiling the environment and labor and our health, you know, then trade makes sense. Um, but the only way forward is for China and the United States to work together 
on these issues because we, we are the two largest trading partners in the world. Um, and so ultimately, I, I, I pray that sort of calmer heads will prevail um, in, in the coming months um, in terms of whether we enter into a trade war or not. Um, if we do, it's, it won't be good for either of us. So we need to do our best to try to avoid that. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you. Uh, and this was a very profound insight, and I think it has enabled China to grow much more smoothly, uh, certainly than uh, post-Soviet Russia and then uh, some of the other post-communist economies that thought that private ownership was the magic key. It really is not. If you introduce private ownership in an economy where the institutions are very poor, where regulation is weak, you basically just get a lot of stealing. And so the Chinese were interested in the long game. They were not interested in having all of their assets uh, stolen by a few insiders. And so they said, no, the state has to retain control of uh, the key, particularly resource and, and uh, commanding heights sectors of the economy.